Yikes. Um, well, thank you for a very kind introduction and for this marvelous uh, multiple day uh, extravaganza of a, I've been to a lot of conferences. This is like one of the best run, nicest, most impressive, most eclectic uh, gatherings. So it's really been a treat to be here. Um, so uh, anyone who counts lies means you have buckle your seatbelt here. Uh, it might be a little uh, detailed here, and I apologize. I, f I don't know what it's about. I'm not that good in math, but I feel compelled to count things occasionally. Uh, <laughs> so I know we all want to talk about this completely nuts, uh, wildest, most expensive uh, money and media circus in the history of any election on planet Earth, and we'll get to that. But I, I uh, can't imagine which candidates we're thinking about there. Um, but, but before I do, I want to give a little bit of a setup because I've been studying this for years and, and lived it a little bit myself. Um, I uh, came to Washington during Watergate, uh, uh, literally that first month of the last year of Richard Nixon's tenure, uh, working for a Republican senator. Uh, they all wanted to hide under their desk. They didn't want to criticize Nixon or not criticize. <laughs> they couldn't win, and it was an extraordinary time. And five years later, I was working for Carl Bernstein, the Watergate, uh, Woodward and Bernstein, um, <clears throat> looking at uh, eight members of Congress convicted of bribery. Uh, welcome to Washington. So, <laughs> so I've been seeing all this for many, many years, perhaps too many years. Um, and I want to, so I want to, first of all, money in politics is not new uh, probably anywhere, but certainly not in the United States. Uh, in my, I, I'm going to mention a few books in a second, but I, I was astonished to learn, I don't know why I was astonished, maybe my youthful idealism was offended, but uh, yes, Abraham Lincoln uh, benefited from railroad workers, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them that were uh, sent in by the railroads, and that helped him get the nomination and win the presidency in 1860. Franklin Roosevelt um, was the candidate everyone knew would remove prohibition, uh, so basically people could drink. Uh, <laughs> and so a certain uh, folks who were interested in a new industry <laughs> involving alcohol were quite excited about FDR. So it's, it, whatever I'm about to tell you, th there is a pattern here but it's, it's clearly gotten a bit out of control. Um, uh, there was a series of four books in the, uh, in the U.S. in 1960, 64, 68, and 72 called The Making of the President by Theodore White, one of the great political writers. That, and, and I'm an odd-mannered guy, but it irritated me that he never really mentioned the word money. And any, it was always about how John F. Kennedy was handsome and speaking here and quoting this person, and it was all very elegant and wonderful to read, but it didn't, I wanted to know where the money came from. I don't know where that came from. So, um, starting in uh, 1996, uh, running the Center for Public Integrity, uh, we put together a, a group of folks, and we followed the money. We literally, hold on to your seat, we went, looked at every single campaign contribution for all the presidential candidates in the United States, the majors. There are two or three hundred people that run for president, but the ones you always hear about are the public officials who have chosen to run. is usually ten people, five people, whatever it is. But, um, and and of, of course we saw extraordinary ties, and we wanted to identify what we called the top ten career patrons. We had a feeling if they were that generous, they gave money repeatedly for a reason. You know, nothing gets by me. I, <laughs> I sort of thought there might be a tip-off there. And yes, there was. Uh, every one of the candidates, and I, I won't go deep on this, but I could. I mean, the anecdotes are pretty, they're a little bit funny, but kind of sad. But um, you could look at their top donors, and you could look precisely at why they kept giving hundreds of thousands over the years. And it was even starting in 96. It was not starting, but it was progressing. This is, you know, what is that, 20, uh, 22 years after Watergate, you're already in a situation where millionaires can give as much as they want. That's from a Supreme Court decision back in 1976. It's before the infamous Citizens United case, which basically opened the floodgates to outside groups. But even in 96, you were seeing signs of this. So um, 
uh, in, in 2000, uh, we did another book. Yes, it's crazy. I don't know why. Uh, but we, uh, for example, the biggest donor was Enron, that uh, company that you may recall was fraudulent, left thousands of people unemployed, and several people committed felonies. But other than that, they were a very good company. Just kidding. <laughs> and and, uh, <laughs> and so, so anyway, uh, Enron uh, was the biggest donor. And one of the best parts of the research was we noticed that uh, the president, George W. Bush, uh, or he was a candidate for president at that point, said he barely knew um, the, the head of Enron. Um, and it turned out from Freedom of Information records that we pulled from Texas, um, he actually had 300 emails and personal notes to the guy, and everything was by this first name. So he basically lied uh, flatly. I don't know how else to put that. Uh, so, um, but this is records. Most journalists don't always read records. Certainly the public rarely gets access to them. Uh, but, so, uh, but the money was rising. You could see the amounts from 96 to 2000. It had substantially gone up. Uh, 2004, uh, these books were all very popular. Uh, public Broadcasting did a, a, a documentary in the U.S. called So You Want to Buy a President. And the top 10 career patrons moved all over the world, and the New York Times did syndicated articles from uh, this work, because no one had ever looked at the money like this, uh, which took, you know, two years and one or two dozen people. Um, in 04, um, the strangest thing happened, usually when there's a sequel to a movie, it's not very good, and maybe this wasn't very good, except it was a bestseller. And I don't understand to this day why, but I'm happy it happened. Uh, we did it again, and we looked at the candidates in that election. And of course, the pattern for all of this was a big upward curve, money increasing at each election cycle. Um, and so, so um, it, it, the cliche is that every four years, the American people endure by far the longest and most expensive election of any nation in the world until the next election. <laughs> and that's, that's pretty much held true all the way to today. So I, I wanted to make sure I laid that, that presidential 20 plus year landscape there because it's a notable one and it's real. Um, before we go further into the current campaign, I want to also mention uh, because of these Supreme Court decisions, there's a lot of outside money now, more than ever we've ever seen. In fact, outside money now is far larger than what the candidates raise themselves. And some of the candidates become a bystander in their own play. Literally, like for the U.S. Senate and the House, other races, lower, you know, smaller races, they will have groups to give questionnaires, do you support this, do you support that? And if you don't answer correctly, you don't get their half a million or their million dollars. And uh, literally, the first buying of the president, we found the biggest single donor in the entire United States was the prison guards of California. And uh, Pete Wilson was running for president, uh, and he didn't win, obviously. But um, he, uh, he filled out the questionnaire for the prison guards, the CCPOA, whatever that stands for, but it's prison guards. They hate when people call them that, by the way. But anyway, the prison guards, um, they uh, have a questionnaire. And one of the questions, do you think prison guards are underpaid and should have a raise? And of course, as a candidate, if you didn't answer correctly, you didn't get any money from them. And so Pete Wilson answered correctly, apparently, and he got a million dollars. He lost, which is somewhat affirming. But, <laughs> but, uh, but it shows you what we're dealing with here. Uh, it is sort of a pay-to-play situation. And this is long before the current election is really the major point I want to make. But the other part is the outside money, as I'm noting earlier, it's not to the candidates. It's around the candidates now. So. We have uh, some controversial billionaires uh, in the U.S., uh, two brothers you may or may not have heard of, Charles and David Koch, and they pledged in this current election to give $889 million uh, to, to contribute to races they cared about in the House of Representatives and the Senate, and yes, the White House. Um, and that is more than the total election spending in a cycle for both political parties, both major parties, Republicans and Democrats. That's an astonishing number. No one has ever seen numbers like that from two people um, who, you know, have a 60,000 employee company and they're all over the world. But, but that was sort of an astonishing thing that happened. Um, and uh, in the first month of 2016 presidential campaign cycle, 
half of all the money raised in the presidential election campaign came from 158 families and, and companies they own or control in the United States. So that was the New York Times reporting, using data, using records, which the good news is we have records about these things, and that's obviously helpful and important. But what in the world <laughs> is going on when you have that kind of thing happening, uh, regardless of the politics or which party, it's really the, the evidence that we're becoming a bystander in our own play with a lot of folks who want to in interfere or influence at least the process. Um, so uh, that politics itself has become a game for the very rich. Uh, over half of the members of Congress in the U.S., ha House and Senate, are millionaires. Only 5 percent of Americans are millionaires. Um, and um, I used to joke that the days of Abraham Lincoln or Harry Truman, both uh, um, fellows who were not what you would call wealthy, just plain folks, however you want to describe it, um, the idea of someone with no means and not a lot of money winning is, is those days are long gone. And um, I used to say that there will never be a sequel to the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington because it became a Stephen King horror movie. You have to have boatloads of cash or you're not even seen as serious. Political reporters are partly to blame because the horse race to them includes do they have an effective campaign? Sounds like an innocuous phrase. That partly means do they have money and do they have people on the ground and all these terms they use. But it really is, you don't have a lot of money, you don't have any of that stuff. Therefore, if you have no money, you're, um, you're not going to win and why bother? And so. Uh, the other thing is, from 1975 to 2000, we studied this, the candidate raising the most money for president the year before the election, before any primaries or caucuses for president, the candidate who raised the most money before got the nomination of their party every single time. Is that coincidental? I don't think so. Um, um, so, so it may not surprise you, and this is, this is what I guess we should feel good about. 84% uh, of the American people have noticed that money has too much influence, <laughs> quote unquote, and that uh, most of the time winning candidates uh, specifically help the campaign donors, their campaign donors once in office, which is also true. Uh, trust in government is at an all, at all time lows in the U.S. Um, in the last uh, election in the U.S. at the federal level, a congressional election in 2014, the turnout was 36.4 percent, the lowest since World War II, when many people were overseas and couldn't vote. Um, so that is the setup to what we're about to discuss. And I just have to mention the other part. Um, I wrote an article uh, about nine or ten months ago about the role of the media, because the only interest that gets rich from the presidential campaign process actually are the news media corporations. Um, why? Because the U.S. I interviewed Jimmy Carter in 2000 for the 2004 uh, Buying the President book, and he said that the U.S. is the only advanced democracy in the world that does not have free airtime for politicians. That is to say, some sort of public process where candidates have access to the airwaves. Um, I interviewed uh, the two crusaders for campaign finance reform, uh, John McCain and uh, Russell Feingold. Uh, each separately, and, and we discussed this issue. They tried for six years to get their reform bill before Congress for campaign finance, cleaning up politics, reducing the amounts of money. And every time they were being blocked by the National Association of Broadcasters in America, the folks representing all the TV stations. And um, uh, they, those broadcasters control the face and voice of every candidate running for office. Uh, so think about it. What politician wants to criticize the media. Uh, and um, they finally, the only way that they could get McCain-Feingold passed, and it was affirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court, it's not been all that effective, that's another issue, but it did get passed, is uh, that they took out grudgingly the provision calling for free air time for politicians. Um, so this is a problem because this is partly contributing, not the only reason, but the reason we have these ludicrous ridiculously uh, expensive, uh, very undemocratic uh, campaigns is not unrelated to all the things I just said. And the media does bear some responsibility, which I recognize the irony since I've worked in the media <laughs> for a few years. Um, 
So, uh, so let's uh, look at the current uh, situation. Yes, I, we will now address this. We have not had a, a primetime game show host who's also a billionaire run for president. That's true. We've had billionaires before, uh, Ross Perot, Steve Forbes, Michael Bloomberg uh, for mayor of New York, but we've never had um, a candidate who was a, a national celebrity from being on TV all the time in addition to being a billionaire. Uh, but anyway, I want to look at the numbers just for a second. You'll see what we're looking at. But first of all, you probably know Trump vanquished 16 Republican candidate opponents. Uh, and if you saw, if you had a chance to see uh, the debates, any clips from the debates, they were sort of like Roman Coliseums. This is great big <laughs> rooms, people shouting and cheering. The old Kennedy Nixon, the first debate in American political history, uh, Nixon and Kennedy in 1960 in Chicago. Um, there was no big audience. Make they couldn't make noise. I'm not even. I think it was on a sound stage of CBS in in Chicago. Um, and so the idea of, of like a, like an athletic event, <laughs> sort of for t debates with who, who, you know, howling and making noises, and it's just it become a football game or something. Uh, so that's what's happened to American politics. And yes, Trump always seemed to be standing in the middle of these debates, literally, physically. I don't know how, if he, how, I'm not going to say how, I don't know why he always ended up in the middle, literally, of the room. So anytime anyone said anything, he would pop in with a comment. There was no decorum. I know I sound sort of uh, precise about that, but it, it was noticeable. And he basically out-talked and interrupted basically everyone throughout, anyone who watched these debates. Um, and so, so here is the situation financially, since it's, the topic is the buying of the present. Um, right now, um, uh, this will be somewhat intriguing, perhaps. I don't know, maybe not. Um, but the candidate that's raised the most money, almost by two to one, is Hillary Clinton. Um, she's going to cross the billion dollar threshold between now and the next four weeks. Um, her latest numbers are $949.6 million, which uh, going over a billion, I think, is going to be a first as far as my, my record keeping goes. That, that's unbelievable. Now, part of that includes these mysterious outside groups called super PACs, and you may have heard of dark money. We have so many groups now, hundreds and even thousands of outside groups that are dumping large sums of money and buying ads. Barely, they'll have they call themselves the Center for uh, Blue Skies or some silly name, and you won't know who it is. And they have no legal obligation to really say a whole lot more. And they're they're overtaking the campaign candidate process in terms of money. Their ads are far more, far more frequent, all the time, and um, it's quite amazing. So anyway, her super PAC money is 183 million as part of the 949 million. Let's go over to Trump. Trump, to date, has raised $449.1 million, and uh, 57 million of that is super PACs. It's almost half. Not, it's a little bit, slightly more than half, but it's pretty surprising, and it surprised me. Uh, in terms of media, this is also interesting, uh, up to January or February, I guess more like March of 16, and the campaign really started to swing around August or September 15. In that period, um, the New York Times has estimated that Donald Trump got $2 billion worth of free media. That he was such a peculiar character <laughs> to run for president. He was entertaining, making quips all the time, calling in the shows all the time, interrupting, but always on the air, everywhere, all the time. And, um, I know that CNN have, has added more staff and they're, they're remodeling their offices <laughs> because they, they have a lot more money this year, a lot of it because ratings have gone up very high because this has become uh, one of those, uh, you know, gladiator shows or, you know, those silly, I mean, this has become a cartoonish uh, situation. Um, so the media buys by Hillary Clinton uh, uh, represent 40, or the money I mentioned that's been raised and spent is 45% of the dollars spent uh, are for the media, for, for advertising so far of that 900. And that, um, well, that part of it, I don't know what percent of is media, but 141 million of what's been um, 
spent for media. That's how much she spent to date. Trump has only spent 25 million. Think about that, 141 versus 25. So he hasn't needed to buy that many ads because he's on all these shows all the time. Now, I think he may start to spend more, but his percentage of money spent for ads is 20% versus 45%. So this is where we are. You, you have to be um, a, a millionaire or a billionaire. Eight of the uh, last 10 presidents in the U.S. were wealthy before they took office. Uh, uh, so we are in a situation here where money and interest that want to influence those in power um, have completely kind of hijacked the whole process. Uh, be believe it or not, back in around, um, around 2000 or 2004, this happened first with the Republicans, but then the Democrats, not to be outgunned, had to match it. Every donor from a company, like the, uh, pick your favorite company, the steel industry, I don't care which one, they would number their checks. Why do they number their checks? This is public, and it was been stated, and it was said under oath, because they wanted to get credit for their contribution. So if the steel industry or a polluting industry, uh, oil and gas type thing, or coal-fired plants, they would, when they go to the next president of the United States and ask for a favor, they want to be able to look at those checks, and keep track of which each company did. Uh, <laughs> this sounds like Tammany Hall in the 1800s in the United States, but it's a presidential campaign process. And, Party. So they wanted credit, and you would think that that would be closer to the word bribery in a way or something, but not in the United States. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to give you a lot of really uplifting news here, but <laughs> I don't really have any. Um, I, 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 the only good uplifting news is that this campaign will be over very soon. <laughs> so um, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.